Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. This is your host for Talk Architecture Podcast, an episode that is a review on an article by the Global Cognition Dog Org, and it's called "How to Develop Your Intuitive Decision Making." So what I'm going to do is review this article, but in the context of architectural design. This article, How to Develop Your Intuitive Decision Making, is by Winston Seek, updated in September 21st, 2021. The first, off the bat, it says here that Intuitive decision-making is the way people make decisions naturally without the use of formal tools and procedures. Some talk about intuition as happening without any thought at all, like trusting your gut or using the force in a sixth sense kind of manner. So when the last couple of episodes when we discuss about what is in the intuition has to do with um, architecture design. It was more like a understanding from discussions and observations. Now, what I would like to do is to use this article to talk about architectural design. So when, when this article started with intuitive decision making, is making decisions naturally that mean that it is there it it doesn't need too much thinking and deliberation it doesn't need much thought and working out or analysis it comes from a practical way of approach to resolving something so Trusting your gut is something that um, many experts are, what shall I say, they recognize scientifically that trusting your gut and having some common sense as an estimate of 95% correct. So... This is remarkable that one felt before that you got to like weigh the pros and cons and make decision after careful analysis. But this is not about something that needs a lot of research. It's something that is already there in you, inherent in you. And maybe you have developed the pattern of thinking or you have gone through the process a lot that it just comes natural to you. So uh, we have architectural design and we have a first year student, which is not used to architectural design. Um, he just started out and they are not sure about things and they need to uh, verify further with the lecturers the tutors It's kind of like something you expect. So, but when you have done it several times and you have seen that what you did was correct and did um, uh, result in the right decision making, then you keep doing the same thing over and over again. So by the year... Year three, for example, at a degree year, you would say that's the right way to go. I mean, you know, and this is decision making that happens all the time in your design process. And going to the third paragraph, our quickest intuitive decisions may sometimes look or feel that way. But it's not quite all that's going on in our heads. Getting a deeper understanding of intuitive decision making is essential to devising ways to improve it. 
First, many personal and professional decisions need to be made relatively quickly. Uh, Therein, uh, the discussion I had with a senior architect were on site dealing with contractors who need you to make that decision quickly. So um, you'd use your intuition. So that skill um, is very necessary when you work on site, for example. You don't have like the whole afternoon um, to decide you're not giving the free reign of the whole afternoon, meaning if you're doing desk work or you're doing work at the office, you may take time in deciding, but when you're at site, people are waiting for you because an hour passed by and it costs money. So, for example, that's how you look at it. Also, that you're dealing with a team and the team has other people working with them, so the contractor or the head of the contractor's team would need to instruct his team members on what to do, like in the next five minutes. So in this uh, uh, article, it says formal decision analysis methods far exceed the resource and time constraints. So you you need to make a quick decision and you have to rely on your gut gut instinct yeah trusting your gut at that moment secondly even when deep analysis is suitable it builds and elaborates on human intuitive decision processes ignoring the human element can set back the entire enterprise what is it to be human The next paragraph says, fortunately, considerable research has been devoted to understanding intuitive decision-making since the 1970s and 1980s. The results provide important clues for training and development. So when you talk about training and development, definitely talk about coaching and mentoring future architects, future graduates. What do we do? What do we do? Um, as tutors in universities, training students of architecture. I had a a little debate with a former colleague when he said that we are not trainers. Lecturers are not trainers. And I disagreed because I was coming, I was doing a workshop with United Nations. And and I was thinking that, hey, we are training um, students of architecture. Because there is this viewpoint, and this viewpoint need need to be said. For many, many years, the professor is like, you know, the ivory tower sort of concept. The professor is there. He's got a lot of knowledge. He's an expert. And you as the student, you go to that professor and gain the knowledge from that professor. The professor is not there to train you. You're the one who has to come up with the big questions or you're the one who has to figure it out that you need to ask this question or that question. And hence, the lecturer is not a trainer. That is the perspective that my former colleague was trying to tell me. Okay, that was the old way, in my opinion. In this day and age, this day and age, I believe that there need to be more guidance because there's so much choice, you know, out there. There's a lot of choices out there, meaning, you know, multiple answers. And students of architecture needed to be guided to ask the right questions so that they're nearer to actually getting the research or what they needed to do. So there is some sort of guidance, which means that there is some sort of training and mentoring happen to develop architecture students. Yes, it wasn't, it wasn't like before where, you know, uh, the way people look at university professors, um, yeah, they deliver their lecture and you're supposed to work it out, your own assignment. And it was not there wasn't much stuff going on in the internet it was also instructional in a way and you learn what you gotta learn 
through the going to the library and doing your study or field work. Nowadays, there's a lot of influences. And do architecture students know the difference between architecture and graphic design? I mean, I'm asking this question because uh, uh, back to the point where a potential uh, good student um, was asking, was thinking to do graphic design the second year. And how would that person come to that conclusion to me that probably too much graphic design is happening in architecture curriculum design, in my opinion. So my conclusion is that there need to be some guidance. You need to actually train um, students of architecture in a way that you're facilitating their growth. You are assisting them with their development. You're not instructional, like, um, you know, cooking videos or something, put this and put that after that and bake 350 degrees. Well, there's a lot of experimentation going on in architectural design. So there is an interpretation going on by the tutor to the as a form of guidance, interpretation as a form of guidance in terms of knowledge so that the students of architecture could actually um, make their own decisions, which is informed. In a way, that's training, in my opinion. Uh, well, maybe we could debate about what my former colleague says, that, archi- that professors don't train students of architecture. But I'm, I would like to say they do. They do train. Anyway, intuitive decision, um, going back to the fact of intuitive decision making and uh, that um, is relating to training and development. So let's get on to the next paragraph. Jenny Phillips, Gary Klein, and Winston Seek examine ways we can improve intuitive decision-making in their paper, expertise in judgment and decision-making, the case for training intuitive decision skills, which appeared as a chapter in the Blackwell Handbook of Judgment and Decision-Making. In our profession, architectural profession, we need to make a the judgment call and decision making. And the fear of making the wrong judgment call or decision making is there. Especially when you are asked, and for the first time that you need to do it, your supervisor or your a director is asking you to make those. So in this book, there is a case for training intuitive decision skills. And I think that is, a, that is worthwhile to read on these articles, even though they are not directly linked to architecture, it is still part of training of the professional. So the, the work that they did is based on studies of experts who make life and death decisions as a normal part of their routine. So let us get on to the next uh, section, expertise and intuitive decision-making. So in the paragraph says, Gary Klein and colleagues at Klein Associates develop the recognition prime decision model based on observations and interviews with firefighters, tank platoon commanders, neonatal intensive care nurses and others who work in fast-paced, high-stakes jobs. Now, that is even faster decision-making than architects, I would say, because it has to do with life and death situation of the human being. So if it's not them whose life or death is at stake, so it is someone else if you're talking about intensive care nurses. So there's early studies are described in Klein's book, Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions. The general idea is that experts make most of the decisions by matching them to their past experiences. This is very, very important, this point. But I'm going to read the other paragraph after this. If they are in a familiar situation, the decision is automatic. They recognize the situation as being like once they've encountered before and an option comes to mind, 
In this sense, the decision feels intuitive at the gut level. Thus, your intu intuitive decision making is often done by matching situations to relevant past experiences and quickly using them to draw conclusions. Yet, this doesn't necessarily mean the experts act without thinking. According to the model, they think about the plausible results of taking the action to determine whether the option is workable or not. And if it's not, they come up with an alternative. They rely on the principle of satisfying, as described by Herbert Simon, an early cognitive scientist and Nobel Prize winner. Hence, applying hypothetical thinking to evaluate options and sequencing the evaluation process efficiently are also essential aspects of intuitive decision making. Finally, in real world critical decisions, the situation may often seem unusual or ambiguous. In this case, in these cases, the skilled intuitive decision maker tries to figure out what's going on. Once they gain some sense of clarity, say by coming up with a story that seems to fit the situation, they get back to the decision at hand. Being able to deal comfortably with ambiguity, uncertainty, and risk, as well as to decide without a complete picture of further aspects of com competent intuitive decision making. The recognition primed decision model shows how experts draw on highly developed intuitive decision making skills to deal with a range of circumstances. In fast paced environments like those most often studied by Klein and other cognitive field researchers, the decision making process is sorted out quickly. So here we have the idea of how it is in architectural design when we look at the model, they call it the recognition prime decision model and under the topic of expertise and intuitive decision making. Let us recognize that in architectural design courses, you come to the point when you're in the final year, the design thesis project. The design thesis project is like 36 weeks out of the whole calendar year of 52 weeks. You have the, the rest of holidays. But in this 36 weeks of three, two and a half semesters, you'll produce some hypothesis because that's what, why it's called design thesis and not something else. Because you are learning to be an expert. As a student of architecture, there is some collaborative learning happen between you and your tutor. If your tutor is not in the same boat with you, they are thinking about other things. They are not really understanding your project when making a decision, then that's the problem. How do you actually collaborate well with your tutor? It takes two to tango. It's not only you alone, but the tutor as well, understanding deeply about the project. But what your tutor has in terms of skills is that they are expert in making decisions before in the different topics that may arise from your design thesis. So you're less of the expert, but you're an expert enough that you have been designing it and you have been reviewing it. You have been reasoning it out with yourself and others and there is some, when the decision-making is to be made, you may consider your tutor's decision-making make, or your tutor's contribution that could help with your decision-making because it's basically eventually up to you. So if a student of architecture allows the tutor to make the decision, that's the worst case scenario. If the student of architecture is not confident enough with their, with their research, with their understanding, they're not expert enough in their topic, then they compensate that 
with the tutor's understanding and wholesale copy of what the tutor says, but it may not be the right decision making. So expertise and intuitive decision making here in this topic relates to um, architecture design. And I've given an example about the fifth year design thesis. We can use the, the example of in the studio, you're a graduate architect, you're going to be a project architect. The next step is to be a project architect. After a couple of years, you've been doing design in the office. But because you're not interested to go to site and learn from the site issues, or you haven't actually been to site at all, you when you start being a project architect, you get stuck with your decision making because there you are face to face with the contractor and you can't make a decision because on site you have to make a quick decision. You haven't had that sort of training in the architecture office or previous training. So you haven't, hadn't been doing the work necessary to, to jump from graduate architect to project architect. Sometimes that's why you become an assistant project architect or an assistant architect to the project architect in a team because that will help you bed in into the project and learn the ropes, so to speak, and then be better at it. But these two examples of the design thesis and how somebody in the architectural practice who needed to be the project architect with little, um, little uh, training because training happens in architecture office as well, you know, and um, we have heard about that a lot. So, okay, we're coming to the end of uh, this article where we're going to read, because we're going to read and then we can apply it in cases that we understand from architecture education and practice. We're going to read parts of this article, the last part, Developing Intuitive Decision Making. So the article says, what are the implications of the recognition prime decision model for building your intu intuitive decision making skills? According to Phillips, Claim and Seek, the essential idea is to strengthen the kinds of knowledge you draw on to make decisions within your job context. That says it all for architectural design, don't you think? Uh, it, it has been implied earlier, as I suggested. I continue with the article. With this approach, you're not trying to become a better decision maker, maker in general. Instead, you focus on decisions specific to your job. That is, you're looking at domain-specific improvements. So this article recognizes the people that did this article, the researchers recognizes that the contacts, um, the knowledge where you draw out to make your decisions is within your job context, with the architectural practice in a specific context of architectural practice. It could be designing a bungalow, it could be designing a shopping mall or housing. So that, that they have different typologies, which has different contexts, obviously. And we're also talking about uh, the context or the site context, apart from the people that is um, involved or are affected by uh, your decision making. So the article continues, for starters, you aim to improve that very fast assessment of situations and the initial options that spring to mind. So if it's a housing project and you've had uh, underst uh, understood what about housing projects um, and also have been to housing projects um, sites or the real case studies of it and going to the site and going through the problems that you have on site, you'll be much better for it in terms of understanding the situation. I continue. To do that, you need to build up a large set of cases involving critical decisions so that you have patterns to match, knowing what kinds of decisions you'll face is a solid first step. Critical decisions in architecture, like housing design. If you're thinking that the housing design that you're doing, I mean, if it is for 
a multi-generational living. I mean, for sure, you need to uh, the critical decisions could relate directly to, definitely, definitely relate to the critical dimensions that you need to know. When do you deal with a multi-generational living? If you're saying that you are considering wheelchair users to be using all the spaces, including the public spaces. We're not just talking about a unit or the different housing unit. We're talking about everywhere. Then you need to understand what is needed to be done, the patterns to match. And because what these cases that you learn about housing would help you in this decision. If not, then you would have to employ a universal design expert and that costs extra money. That's just giving you an example. So maybe people who's doing a shopping mall, for example, that need to be knowing what is the critical decisions involved in shopping mall, maybe the entrance or where people come in uh, or the parking and where you decide where to park and how do you come in through the, what lifts. You know, I mean, this is one critical decisions that I feel that shopping malls should have that it is clear at the parking area how you're going to enter the mall. So I've been to malls that are very good at it and I've been to malls that are very kind of like it's a guessing game. Okay, so you should also study a set of cues that signify what's going on, what to do in that situation. And you'll want to develop a deeper understanding of how things work or what causes what. This kind of knowledge is sometimes called a mental model. Now, I would imagine if you're a site architect dealing with contractors, you'd know what the questions that the contractors would have and you'd know how to answer them. At least the questions that are kind of usual that you need to understand. Or if the drawings don't have them, you've got to go in give the decision making. But of course they follow a certain type of drawing, but there could be some changes that has been done and which you should know what are the implication of those changes at hand. When they start hacking a wall and they will start blocking something or make some decision with car parking circulation, for example. So therefore that mental model that this article is saying is a conceptual model of many things. So students of architecture in architecture, uh, in the, when they studied architecture in schools of architecture, they learn about concepts and they learn many things. So it's an introduction course. But as you develop yourself, you would recognize that these concepts are actually mental model that you know for sure that certain building type has to deal with certain mental model. For example, a bungalow and the issues of a bungalow uh, in that is certain uh, area and how you could imagine that the space is like in terms of the area needed and if there's lack of area on the ground you need, need to build it up to more than a couple of stories so so hence there are some decisions that you got to make if you're going to build it up to a couple of more than a couple of stories if you're thinking about a universal design or adaptive design, then how are you going to get in the lift later on? How are you going to design in such a way that construction-wise, it won't cost as much to build a lift in the in the in the in the house if one will grow uh, with the house or the house the house has a grow home sort of concept a lifetime home or something like that. Finally, to think through possible outcomes and cope with ambiguity, you need to go beyond building core knowledge. You also need to develop your own, your critical thinking skills. One way to build up your knowledge base is with on-job training and coaching. At the most informal, you can carefully watch the seasoned, skilled performers at work and you ask them tons of questions to get their stories and insights. These vicarious experiences become part of your knowledge base that drives your intuitions. Naturally, this relies on you to take ownership 
of your learning. A leader, trainer, or other talented development professional can formalize this general approach by creating case studies and scenario-based training approaches. Material for these can be reaped from subject matter experts using knowledge elicitation methods, such as cognitive task analysis. Okay, this is beyond me, but I'm just reading this for the sake of our discussion, and I'll go further. By studying critical cases, you accumulate examples, notice patterns among them, and draw lessons learned. The scenario base a bracket or critical incident close bracket instructional method is similar with it the facilitator leaves out the solution and outcome of the case here the learner practices assessing situations and making decisions typically under time pressure a coach or facilitator asks questions to get the learner to describe current critical events, options they're considering, and how they anticipate those paying out, playing out. Well, during design crit or the table crit, the tutor could um, give tests or even with the project at hand where the students ask things, you could you leave out the solution and outcome of the case, but you this instructional method is a scenario based situation. We've done that before. Like, we asked students to think about the user. Okay, just say it's um, art gallery. And we asked this, the scenario that the um, artist in residence is upstairs. How do one actually uh, able to monitor the whole gallery? Uh, besides using a um, CCTV, how do how do one actually could feel that one could know if people are coming into the gallery, for example? So there are other scenarios as well, depending on the project at hand or the brief at hand. Um, even bungalow design, like uh, if I'm in the kitchen and at the swimming pool area, how would I know? Um, if somebody is at the door sending the grab without getting the phone or something. I mean, these are just situations or scenarios which the student of architecture will start thinking, hey, okay, maybe I can use um, some sensory design or something that could indicate somebody is around, things like that. So with this approach, the approach of the learner practice assessing situation and making decisions. Um, with this approach, you improve your intuition decision making, the deliberate focus practice, much as you would when learning to ski or ride a bike. So the student of architecture, through the, these scenarios, uh, this way of decision making would um, remember that, okay, um, this concept can be used if I were to design for pr um, private spaces or house. So they've already understood that concept, which would solve the problem at hand. Decision-making is something you do naturally all the time. You draw on your intuition to clarify situations, sort out your options, and make choices. That doesn't mean you call on your animal spirit guide or trust your untrained gut to make tough choices. Instead, you study and practice and making the specific kinds of decisions you are trying to improve, and you solicit feedback to tune your intuitions. So I'm making my conclusion based on this article. It can be verified further, validated further with more, uh, more research or more interviews. But the conclusion I'm making to how is the intuition uh, applicable in architectural design or how the, how how would, uh, what is the intuition in architectural design? That sort of 
the three part series that we're doing here um, sort of give an idea of where for those who want to know about this uh, particular subject, um, do the necessary research and finding out more and set up your objectives and the framework to find out more, obviously. So I hope that has given enough um, sort of information to kickstart um, this topic that you may find interesting and relevant to your own understanding of architecture and architects, what architects do. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.